Hi there. Well, we definitely uh, are seeing, you know, post-election in the U.S. Uh, a lot of turmoil still about who and how that presidency is going to transition. And I've commented on it off and on over the last year or two. And I've also don't want to get caught up in all of that dynamic because uh, one of the more larger realities that we're facing is ecological issues. And what I'm gonna talk about today in the talk I'm gonna share with you is on ecological issues. And so this talk um, that is a, I did it uh, two weeks ago as a memorial lecture in, in Kerala, India, and it was for a particular college you'll see on the PowerPoint presentation that will follow here. And I'm going to leave my video on just so that I can comment and maybe stop the video now and then and fill in a few pieces because of when I gave that lecture on fear and ecology or ecology and fear, actually the reverse of those two, um, the issue is really which one should we be paying most attention to as an ecological problem and what I call a fearological problem. So it'll be an interesting uh, talk, I think, to share here. We've, with the help of my partner, Barbara Bickle, we've edited in half. So this will be the lecture half. And then the second half I'll also put up on the YouTube channel, and that will be the Q&A after, which I had some very astute questions from people in that part of the world and uh, spent quite a bit of time, uh, over 40 minutes of answering questions, thinking through, and I wanna also edit on that and do a extra Zoom video with that because I, I didn't answer all the questions as good as I could have. Well, again, let's just drop in for a moment to contemplate before I begin the PowerPoint and screen share here that, um, ecological problems, ecological problems um, are going to be really still remain no matter who's president uh, in the United States or any other election. And so unlike a lot of pundits who want to make comments and share their expertise on why this is so important, this election here or there, as I say, anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'm pretty convinced um, that those are not our biggest problems. Our biggest problems are going to be really deeply ecological and ecological. And that's what this talk is today. So let me go to the screen share and let's get started. And if all goes well, I'll find the video, share it. And there we go. So I'll make comments as we go. Let's get started. And it's not surprising. I think by the end of this talk, you will understand. I feel like I'm uh, living in a philosophical diaspora here in North America. I feel like perhaps my ancient soul is actually much more from the East. But I have to live where I am in the West. And I'm trying to teach the West things that the East has known for a very long time. So before I begin, I just want to thank Dr. Remy George and the original person who uh, is a colleague I've met on the internet, which is Dr. Rayson Alex. Um, he apparently is one of the students from, from your university college. Uh, Dr. Rayson Alex, uh, again, one of the universities in India, he's also going to be the guest editor, um, him and another colleague uh, of the International Journal of Fear Studies um, for the 22 issues in 2021. And they're going to be on uh, ecological issues and fear in many different ways. So look forward to his editing that new issue and I'll keep you in touch when that comes out. And then I want to say uh, I want to appreciate that Kerala has come on my mind on my radar over the years. My wife is also a scholar in feminist studies and interfaith studies and uh, one of the things she told me several years ago that stuck in my mind was Carol is a very unique part of the world. I certainly maybe don't have to tell you who are there that fact, but she said it was one of the most interfaith, historically interfaith cultures, communities, area, geographically, et cetera, and historically. And you know that uh, was for her uh, something actually she spent some time studying what had gone on in Carol's history for that interfaith. And I think that is also a good sign 
for what I'm going to be talking about today is certainly that kind of interspiritual, interfaith embrace and you know integration is so important to in a sense really undermining the domination of fear and fear-based ways of living so so there we're talking about ecological issues and then i'm talking about the interfaith spiritual movements which are attempting to get beyond a fear base right and it's that's the ecological movement that's going on with this ecological movement and both awarenesses both have been around for a long time both I think are needing to come together. And that's why I mentioned the interfaith movement as just one example of uh, what I'd call a beginning of a fearlessness movement uh, because of the fear of the other, the fear of the difference, the fear of, you know, whether it's religion, ethnicity, race, color, gender, and so on. Thank you and congratulations to the history of Parallel as an area for that. So why an English department uh, is interesting to me. I'm going to be talking, uh, I'll put the PowerPoint point up in a second here. I'm going to be talking about uh, eco-criticism was a topic that was suggested to me. And that is how literary criticism analyzes and looks at fear. And well, that's not quite exactly correctly what I wanted to say. Um, eco-criticism is more um, the study of ecology and literary criticism together. And they do look at fear a little bit, but as you see, I'll point out it, eco-criticism theorists do not look at it fear enough. Those relationships between the two is what I'll be looking at. So I'm gonna share a screen now. And just to let you know, I found the eco-criticism material um, came up for me. Just give me a moment. Well, it came up um, probably a couple of years ago when I was contacted by um, one of the scholars. I think it was Simon Estock at the time, and I'd seen on the internet he had this term ecophobia. And then I ended up really researching on how people were using the notion of fear and ecology in literary studies. And that's a whole field of domain of, you know, what kind of literature, right, is around the world in the arts, humanities, um, but literature in that normal way we think of it. I'm thinking, of course, in my language of English literature, that through history has had this interest in nature and the relationship of humans to nature. And now we might call it humans' relationship to ecology. Okay, so that's what we're playing with. And, and then that's really the, where eco-criticism developed. It's here to get this. I'm not too used to it. What happened there? Okay, and I'll just get on the... So hopefully you can all see that. Yeah going to move this away out of the way okay so first of all i wanted to introduce with a few stories um that a little bit about my background and i really come to eco criticism which is really the connection of art and nature um in two ways so this is how i come to it let's walk through a few stories as a young little boy, I, I was immediately taken into a lot of natural environments, thanks to my father, even though we were working poor class. Um, he always went fishing and made sure that we got lots of neat experiences in nature, and eventually I became quite a nature lover. And one of the things that I do when I was out fishing and hunting and uh, with my dad is, is I would always sit down and, and, have, and spend that quiet time in nature. And something occurred to me over the many years even as a young person i would say by 14 15 i was starting to really ask myself questions about why is human societies at least as i experienced so neurotic and why did i not see that same neuroses of qualities of you know behaviors and attitudes in nature so that started making me ask questions what happened between nature and culture and of course, I'm really talking about neuroses there. Sounds like a psychological concept, um, but it has real physiological implications of 
what I'd call neurotic behavior or dysfunctional behavior, behaviors that are not life supportive in the end, and the result is pollution. So real physiological, physical, um, chemical pollution in the environment. And uh, as a fisherman, I experienced that at about 15 years old when we were out fishing in, in a stream that we'd always gone to and basically brought home some fish and started frying them up and they smelled horrible and had black oil um, oozing out of the flesh. And my dad said, do you know what this is? And, you know, this is awful. We can't eat this. And I said, well, no, what is that? And he said, well, that's oil. And that comes from the oil refineries probably up a river on the, the river where we caught these fish. And that was really my awakening to the problems of ecological issues and environmental issues. Now, as an artist, uh, this is one of my paintings way back from the 1980s. I became a wildlife painter as part of my also entering into wildlife ecology studies. I was also always interested in art. And what I learned to do in that process of moving from nature into art and art into nature was I really had the chance to explore detail. And that's something that you do. You learn the patience of a fisherman. Uh, sitting at the edge of this, the river and fish aren't biting and you have to start observing and entertaining yourself and I just started looking at everything in fine detail and that became very useful for my artwork to do these kinds of art pieces and then the other thing as I said there's a sort of peacefulness and I showed these two images just to give us a sense of the kind of peacefulness that tends to come from nature not that I'm saying nature is in by any ways all benign. Nature is definitely challenging. Nature has its own destructive forces and its own will in a sense. But that calm and peacefulness was something that I sought and I sought it in my body. I could feel that I felt calm in the natural landscape. That's important when we're going to be talking about um, the topic of fear. Um, but I also watched in nature that, and this is from a drawing I did in the 80s as well, is that there are predators. In fact, nature, if you look at the fundamental principles, it is operating on who's eating who and who's escaping from who. So there's this love that I developed in the natural and the observational and the love because it made me feel good. It, nature made me feel love. I love nature and I found it much harder to love human beings. I found it much harder to love culture in that sense. So I put in the predator here on the right side as a demonstration of nature is also a, uh, basically an ecology of predator and That's uh, sorry for the background noise when somebody had their mic on and who was one of the viewers of this uh, lecture, it eventually shuts off pretty quick here, but just ecology of predator-prey relationships. Um, now there's quite a field called uh, the ecology of fear. Um, I've seen it in literature for probably at least two decades, um, increasing rapidly in the last decade. And ecologists, biologists, environmental kinds of people who are out in the field uh, have come to really understand the importance of predator-prey relationships in affecting the entire ecology. So even when we look at this beautiful scene, right, of these trees, the grass, the flowers, the sun shining through, it's sort of almost uh, nostalgic for this wonderful paradisical state. Um, that grass, those plants, those trees, not only do they have, you know, their own botanical ecology going on between plants and fungi and all those kinds of things, bacteria, and the natural environment of moisture and the cycles of nitrogen and water cycles, et cetera. But what's actually shaped a lot of that actual vegetation itself has been the different relationships and the dynamic relationships of predators and prey. So example, if you don't have certain kind of prey and predator relations, the mammals, for example, or even insects, will be eating up a lot of those plants and destroying them if the predators are not controlling the population uh, ecology of those you know, predators on plants. And so everything there you see is actually the part of that dynamic. 
and they're calling it nowadays research is the ecology of fear. I've adapted my own version of the ecology of fear and theorizing, and that's something uh, I won't be sharing much in this talk, but if you're interested, you can ask me. So that will come back later. Okay, next slide. So there was, I'm just gonna go back just a tad here because I did miss, there's two stories there. Let's just see if I can. So that will come back later. Um, so university there, you see that, 1978. Um, I never actually got to that story in the lecture. Very briefly, um, I was in environmental biology. I'd already done a degree in ecological studies, uh, a diploma as a wildlife biologist for a few years, then went back to university, got this environmental biology degree. And around 1978, um, again, I was kind of a science geek, right? So very interested in just natural sciences, empirical studies, and um, good observation, and that was a reality. But I came to this professor I was working with in the zoology department, and uh, we ended up writing a paper together on this particular bird observation I had made, a rare bird observation in Cypress Hills National Park. And we, at some point writing that article, got to know each other really well. I was in his home and spent some time with him, and he was an older fellow and been around. And at one point he said to me, well, you know, at that time I was called Robert, he said, you know, you know, if you want to be successful in the world of actually, you know, solving some of the environmental ecological problems we've got, and he says, basically, you're going to have to get out of just science and a scientific approach, and you're going to have to look at people and their value systems. And I'll never forget that. Um, so you can imagine how long ago that was, 1978. Um, I'm just finishing, you know, my bachelor of science degree and all of a sudden he's telling me I, I need to be really looking and studying values and how value systems and worldviews work. And whoa, that, that was really quite an eye opener because I hadn't, I sort of knew values were important, how people value nature and how they then treat it and how tell, they tell stories and create a relationship with nature. But I never really thought about the study of values itself. And that was the beginning of my move probably into what we just call psychology and anthropology. Okay. Next story uh, was 1989 there. I'll just see if I can get it to go back um, again. Basically an ecology of predator. Whoops, just trying to find it there. Come back later, okay. Whoa. Okay, we got it, 1989, um, NPLE, near, I don't even remember what that stood for when time when I was, I don't remember it now, but ISOF is what's more important. Um, I had this experience in 1989 of, again, having this real scientific background, um, and I'd been in psychology, you can see a bit more between 78 and 1989. And I was doing healing work and I was learning all about the kind of interior parts of human existence and reality, even mystical parts of that. And I'm reading literature from the East and West, North and South on the interior part of reality, right? This value sphere I was talking about or worldview sphere and, and how and why humans are neurotic. I was really in search of that, like almost like a psychiatrist would be. But I came from many different perspectives, and you can see art and a natural nature perspective, an environmental perspective uh, was my way into this. But I had this huge experience in 1989 of really breaking open my heart to another human being in an immense love experience. And what came out of it was uh, the In Search of Fearlessness uh, project, and that's what ISOS stands for there. And that was really my love experience, uh, kind of, a, I think, near-perfect love experience, NPLE. I think that's what that uh, represented when I was playing with it. Near, kind of like a near-death experience, but this was a near-perfect love experience. Uh, and it's a phenomenon that, you know, not everybody has. And I just want to point that out, that even though I did fear studies, In Search of Fearlessness was a focus on fear studies and the relationship with fearlessness, and it was always the question, well, you know, how is that related to love? Um, a larger topic for another time, but I would let you know that those were two really major turning points for me uh, of what I began to study. Next slide.
I'm just going to talk a bit about my brief. Um, well, basically in 1989, I started a full-time kind of career and that was through a very powerful experience I won't have time to go into. 1989, uh, I had a discovery that basically fear is what conditions me and love is more or less sacrifice. So that study, informally, I was not at a university at that time, but I had finished my you know, environmental careers and I was switching into education. So that's really important to know that really fundamentally, I think as an educator, I think as an artist, obviously, and I also think as a scientist. And um, I thought well, I'd show this slide of making a fearologist, which is a word that had been around and I've kind of played with it. And then now it's sort of become more and more serious. So we're talking about 31 years of my thinking about this work. So my research, trajectory when I went to university, which was in later, much later, um, um, but even before university, I started collecting all these cards and I was making these cards on basically what are called fear quotes. Here's an example of one. So I have boxes and boxes full of these and this was just my way of doing research. So what I was doing is I was just going to any book, any articles I was reading and finding, and again, across disciplines, more or less. And I would look at quotes like this and I would write them all down. I would organize them and categorize them so I could try to find patterns. Now, that's what scientists do. You collect data, you collect specimens. And so I had this idea as a scientist, I was gonna collect specimens of how humans talk about fear. And that's across cultures, history, across disciplines, popular culture it didn't matter i said it's a specimen of how people talk about fear i said from the study of those i might start to learn so this is just one methodology i use so it, this is really you know collecting quotes you can see i have the author the year i have the page number of the quote um, sometimes i would make my own notes on it like i did at the top here it's i see I say jewish this is a love fear of god discourse in red ink there and i'm underlining some you know, keywords. And that was all for research purposes. Um, really what I really see these as is specimens, just as a biological scientist, um, you collect specimens and then you analyze them and you try to then put them together to, you know, make a big picture of what is the actual situation going on. So in a way here, I'm really looking at the ecology of knowledge. Um, and I was very interested, often I saw this talk about love and fear being so primary in many discourses. And this particular quote comes from my box on, I think, religious quotes um, under that category. Um, but I also was just adding up, putting cards in, what were effects of fear, what were causes of fear, um, how was fear related to culture, politics, spirituality. And I had all these cards in, in various categories. And then when I went to university in 2003 for graduate school, uh, I ended up more or less, though, of course, is much bigger than Sorry about that. Go rep. Well, go Don't back. pick any one perspective. Look at all perspectives. I'll go back. Problems. They are hit too far. And we're starting. Hit too far. Range arrow. The sphere. There we go. An educator. At that time, I was doing a PhD in education. I was asking myself, are educational systems in general i was certainly looking at the west north america primarily are we adequately informing ourselves as adults as educators and therefore our students and our societies is socialization is the educational systems actually sufficiently and adequate to what I will be talking about today is the fear problem. And so what I noticed in discourse hegemony is basically I'm studying texts, studying what the discourse is behind those texts. And discourse is a very complex term. I won't go into it today. But it's how do we form knowledge and power about fear? OK, so I'm actually much more interested in the discourse of text then I am actually interested in the bio, neurological, psychological. I'm interested in that too, but I'm interested in the sociological function of knowledge and power. 
And actually, I'd add right now, it, I'm interested in the architecture um, that builds the structures of understanding, of knowledge, of meaning. And those structures, like systems, um, sort of almost have a life of their own that goes way beyond the individual here. And that's why at some point you really have to get outside of biology of fear and the psychology of fear, the physiology of fear, the neurobiology and such that are so popular today. And I've found that that's one of the reasons literary uh, studies is, is interesting because we're, we actually want to study fear as it portrays itself through discourses that are in literature, through metaphors, through other kinds of literary devices. And maybe we'll understand fear in, in a different way, you know, in, in a complementary way, right? That discipline plus many other disciplines, geography and so on. What I say is how fear gets distributed, reproduced, and maybe in good ways, yeah, some of that discourse and text that I've collected, you can imagine I have tens of thousands of these samples. Um, but I'm just going to suggest that uh, there's some real problems I found. Uh, and I'll go through a little bit of that today. So let's go to eco-criticism just for a moment. I'm going to show you a slide to just kind of get our brain thinking and imagining about a possibility. So here. So culture of extinction, you'll see, is at the top of the slide here. Culture of extinction comes from this actual conference. That was one of its themes. Um, was They were concerned, the organizers of this conference, that there are a lot of narratives, there are a lot of discourses arising of late uh, in the last few years, particularly as we, we see the dire, dire straits of our planetary ecosystems and social e e ecosystems as well in terms of will they actually, will we make the next 10 years uh, without burning the planet up just through global warming as one possibility. And then of course, extinctions, and then of course, wars and migration problems and conflicts. Um, so this precarity of the future is really the theme of the conference. And that's kind of why I designed this slide um, the way I did. And you'll get a chance to see um, my, my little way of understanding that uh, brings ecological and ecological issues together. Artist at, at, uh, at work here. So I was interested in what are the primary global pollution dangers? Well, one of the ones that's arisen in the last, you know, certainly since I was environmental studies in 1970s, when I first went into reading ecology, already the greenhouse effect global warming was already well recognized in environmental studies. So we're talking early 70s, even before that. But this was not a new problem. But it was only, you know, within probably the last decade that it really, you know, came to the foreground. Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth in 2004, brought CO2, carbon dioxide, to the present. And what he was showing, it was graphs of you know, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere over history and time has increased and increased with civilization's development. A uh, human, there are not other factors, of course, for carbon dioxide changes in, in, um, in points, you know, concentration. However, human made or human originated uh, carbon dioxide, and certainly with the Industrial Revolution, you know, was a major factor. So I had this analogy. This is what I'm sharing with you on this slide. The analogy was, I said, well, I think from my point of view, I'm going to put fear as an analogy of carbon dioxide. And the reason it's so an interesting analogy is that carbon dioxide is absolutely natural. It's actually totally what we do. We breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants take in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen in this wonderful system, you know, in balance. Uh, but once the concentrations of car carbon dioxide, in other words, too much of a good thing, right, even too much of a natural thing, starts to become toxic. I thought about fear. Okay, fear, we, many of us would argue, and many of those discourses say fear is natural. Fear is something that we need for, uh, you know, alerting our system biologically, psychologically to deal with threat and possible risks. But the problem is that I also was just marking out a trajectory that you could probably argue 
that fear has also increased in concentration in the generic psychological cultural sphere if you want not just the physiosphere like carbon dioxide but in the mind sphere the sphere of the newosphere and the, you could even say even in the spiritual world so then i became interested in why is this rise of you know increase we know what carbon dioxide has caused what's caused carbon dioxide to increase so intensely but i said well what about fear what do we know historically about fear of course the historians will often say well you know we should probably they'll tell me you know don't be so worried you know fear's not so bad now man can you just be a lot you know think about living in the middle ages can you just think about living you know where you could be uh, uh, suffering from diseases we don't have medicine so that became a huge argument right the problem of well is fear actually increasing or not increasing and I'm not going to go into the history of fear. There's a whole literature on the history of emotions nowadays, historians, uh, history of fear itself. Many people are writing books on that. That's interesting. But I also want to say I'm not going to get caught in how historians, number one, how they define fear. Now, I'm transdisciplinary, as I said, as a fearologist. So I don't get caught in reading fear through only and interpreting it through only one lens one discipline. So keep that in mind as we just kind of walk through this slide presentation. So I became interested in when fear started to really increase. And I think at that red arrow there that you see, I'm going to call that probably the time when humans moved in their evolutionary cycle from hunters, gatherers to agriculturalists, horticulturalists. And that, there are various literatures available. Um, by archaeologists, feminist archaeologists, scholars that I'm interested in, when we move from a participation culture or a, you know, a cooperative culture overall in our evolutionary systems, we're talking 10 to 12,000 years ago, to that shift around 10 to 12,000 years ago, we became ma mainly agricultural. And what we see are trajectories within cultural evolution of more and more dominator cultures. So I'm quoting the work of Rianne Eisler here. Rianne Eisler's work is based upon a lot of the feminist archaeology of Maria Gambudis. Phrasing, and she said one of the two main factors of that change from you know participatory cultures to more dominator cultures was that fear and mistrust in the dominator culture are primary agents for power and domination. So now we're in a culture sphere, um, as I'm talking this post-agricultural explosion, um, culture was shifting, right? Culture evolving from that hunter-gatherer to now this agricultural base and an economy is based on that kind of um, system of agriculture and changing distribution of how humans were living and where they were living, how they treated the land and had a relationship to the land, their worldviews are starting to shift. So all of that, we, what I it didn't emphasize enough in this talk was that word fear all of a sudden now has to start to shift um, from fear as we knew it in pre-agricultural societies and civilization to now a different kind of post agricultural civilization although we're still in the post you know the agriculture doesn't like it disappeared but it's that transition now and that shift where i actually think we're, we're working with a different kind of fear accumulation um, that's a longer theory uh, i do explain it a little bit later in this talk um, to just mark that on on your mind right now that Fear itself is also evolving and changing as this accumulation concentrations goes up. The qualitative change is going on. I'm only mapping here the quantitative change. Rather than so much cooperation. Not saying cooperation still isn't going on in those cultures and even now, but it starts to become fear and mistrust as actually deriving from and often from power elites within those cultures so i basically said from that kind of time forward now the orange arrow fear was increasing that's post 9 11. so that's what that arrow represents 
and I'll just move this diagram so I can kind of see what my my thing is. Okay, so 9-11, I thought was, when I was in graduate school, I said, this is a pivotal historical moment. This is not only historical, this is like an evolutionary moment. Now, I might be exaggerating that, but that's my case. And really because there was a very unique symbol, symbolic, sociological, political structuration that came out of North America. And that's a structuration, restructuration, I would argue, of the very nature of what fear is and our relationship to fear. And out of America, per se, the United States, through the president's announcement that they would now classify that after 9-11, that the United States was going to you know, enter a preemptive war, preemptive and also reactive war, against basically all terrorism, and they called it the War on Terror. I collected and collected discourses again. Uh, I'm very fascinated by how we shape stories and narratives. And of course, you know, literary criticism is also interested in that, and the politics behind it, the psychology behind it. And that War on Terror was basically, wow, humans? Okay, so here's my quick take. Humans finally came to the realization after post 9-11, and I'm not saying this is a good, you know, way that they did it in the United States in their declaration as a government. But what they came to is that war on fear. Of course, terror just being the extreme of fear. And I said, wow, here we now have humans talking about a war on fear. In other words, humans are so terrified is a general background that they've now are going to take a war out on fear right so here we have the problem of fear as a motivator trying to solve the problem of fear and that is a kind of definition of the fear problem capital f capital p as i define in my work for the last 30 plus years is those kind of really complicated problems in the construction of fear itself and our knowledge. I.e. terrorism is one characteristic example or exemplar of how fear manifests. Okay, so we'll just go through this. So I think a culture of, ex culture of extinction as this program, your conference is about, is related to a culture of fear. And that's, supposed to be the slide but right now my powerpoint is not advancing i'm not sure why it seems stuck let me just try oh there we go okay so i basically argued that if we want to look at primary global pollution dangers fear is a problem fear creates a toxicity that is way above and beyond and Using this diagram, I'm now going to go into a little quick theory of how I understand this relationship in an integral perspective. And I'm going to use this word and define integral, why I use an integral methodology. So first of all, this rise in, in uh, carbon dioxide, I'm, I'm going to call the eco problem. And I'm talking again, global here, evolutionary. I think our human species has to deal with this problem or we're in big trouble. And we're starting to, right? That's the whole green movement, right? Which is part of your green philosophies analysis that's going on. And the next part, when we put fear together in the story of trying to solve major global problems, I call that the ego problem. So this is gonna be an idea that is gonna move into the next slides and you're gonna see why I'm putting them together. But just hang in with me slowly here. First of all, Look at eco and ego here, capital E, not as in just ecological and not as in just egological. So the larger theory behind eco and ego comes from Ken Wilber, an integral philosopher in America right now. I followed his work for the last 30 plus years and find his theorizing about um, the movement of the integral movement of all life um, is kind of a general theory of everything that he has put into a metaphysical map. Um, the eco, ego, sorry, E-G-O, um, is the arising, you know, of consciousness and ascending that pursues knowledge and truth. 
and the ego, eco, sorry, is the return, the descent path of knowing and reality. Again, that would be a much larger conversation. You can ask me about later if you want. Uh, in other words, I'm getting beyond just psychology and I'm getting beyond just science. I'll show you where I'm going. I was interested in 1999, a book came out called The Ecology of Fear. I've never seen that term ever used before. Again, I studied discourses on fear for 30 years. When ecology got mixed with fear as a natural ecology of fear, and Mike Davis comes out of urban studies um, and a cultural studies background. And he was really looking at the combinations of eco problems in the Los Angeles area of North America, one of the major cities in the West Coast, and how fear seems to influence not only fear as a reaction to the environmental problems they have, but fear then breeds and constructs those very ecological and environmental problems at the same time. So you had a cycle here of the eco and the ego problem interacting and reinforcing each other. And it creates such a complexity of problem, that's why it's virtually intractable to, uh, to solve. It's, it's what some people have called a wicked problem. So bottom line, the pollution, um, a poor use of uh, drainage of water in the aquifers in California, for example, around that area, and the massive pollution due to environmental conditions and meteorological conditions, and the drying of the grasslands and the massive fires that are you know chronic in that area ecologically and of course all of that brain breeds upon um, insecurities for the people and obviously the other creatures but just speaking for a human's point of view um, this insecurity um, then builds leads to certain kinds of ways of defenses that the society tries to cope with those insecurities of, let's just say, you know, massive grass fires and landslides due to soil erosion going on in the area. Never mind all the traffic problems, pollution, violence in the cities, and so on. And so, uh, we're talking really here about you can't extract the, the issue of fear and the quote ego problem from security issues, safety and security issues, and that all becomes part of management and governance to look at some problems are more than just problems. They are wicked problems. So eventually, bringing this eco perspective and ego perspective together, I'm suggesting is a future way of thinking and imagining our major global problems. So we don't want to just look at eco by itself. We also want to look at the fear problem with it and an integrated. That. So I call this a critical integral. A perspectival methodology, a perspectival comes from the work uh, primarily of uh, Jean Gibser, uh, a poet and philosopher historian in the 40s and 50s, and then Ken Wilber and others, a few others, have also elaborated on what a perspectival is. I explain it briefly here. Perspectival is a term that's basically it's called vision logic sometimes. It's the sort of a next level of consciousness above rational consciousness. As some developmentalists have argued and evolutionary people in, or evolutionary psychology. And basically it says don't pick any one perspective, look at all perspectives. In other words, don't be always favoring your bias in one perspective of understanding problems. We need to look at larger problems. Okay, so let's go now to the next slide. Let's move this out of the way for a moment. Okay. Next slide, basically I'm saying is that eco-criticism, when I've gone on the internet and looked at some of the ways eco-criticism is being taught, and I'm not an expert in eco-criticism, but it's when literary studies basically brought in ecological issues and took a ethical perspective on literary criticism. And it had this idea, you know, that uh, fear um, is important. Um, eco-criticism, you could find it in some of the literature of eco-criticism. However, what you couldn't find was very much emphasis on. It would say fear is an emotion, fear is a factor, a psychological factor, fear is natural, but fear is also constructed. And they said that becomes a problem. So some eco-criticism, you'll find some of that um, issues going on. So constructed fear here being, you know, something beyond that bio, natural, biological, typical sort of genetic-based psychology of a fear response and fear 
um, systems, your management systems really, or your defense systems. And when you get into more complex cultural arrangements, and remember we were talking earlier about um, after agriculture developed again from to make societies much more complex and changes their economies and such and their worldview, that now we have a fear, uh, as I said, a qualitatively different kind of fear, which I put fear marks on. And I think I talked about that briefly in the video. Again, I'm not sure why my PowerPoint's not working in there in that moment. There we go. Okay, so ecology and fear. You can see basically ecology in eco-criticism is much more important than the concept of fear. That's why I made fear smaller in letters here. And that's not to me a good thing because I'm, one, I'm looking at now, eco-criticism has its own discourse hegemony. And like any criticism, any discipline, it can get into its own bias, its own perspectivism, rather than an a perspectivism. And that discourse or domination of ecology over fear, I think, is a problem. So that's a big point in my lecture today. The eco view by itself does not give fear enough, um, except one area started to interest me in just the last few years. I probably two or three years ago, I became aware of the work of Simon Estock, an eco-criticism scholar. And he had written a book on ecophobia in many articles. I said, ah, now there is something that interests me. Because as someone interested in fear, now eco is being connected with phobia. And he was arguing in his work that eco-criticism needs to look at ecophobia as a major universal uh, construct. And I'll give. So this um, S. Doc's work, you know, has a certain resonance with what I talked about earlier, uh, with this foundation of an ecology of fear, this predator-prey relational ecology that's fundamental to all life forms and ecosystems on uh, on this planet, anyway, that we know of. And um, it's so fundamental that, again, really, you could argue, right? It is fear operating within the ecological systems that creates, you know, predator prey relations of a kind of, you know, phobia toward being attacked toward predators, or at least if not a pathological phobia, I prefer to say it just brings a high alertness and awareness. However, that's in the natural world. Once you get into the culture world, that alertness, awareness turns into things like emergencies, people fear-mongering, using scare-mongering techniques, the sky is falling, you know, listen to me, follow me. Uh, various authorities throughout history have constructed themselves as the saviors of helping people secure themselves, right, under those insecurities of these predator-prey relations. And, of course, within culture, that can be, you know, various tribes dominating other tribes, um, nations and empires dominating and causing, you know, massive destruction in trying to dominate over others. But the ecophobia that Estoc was using was just a basic notion, not quite as complex as mine. Uh, there's an inherent pattern that he calls inherent, I would say inherent within cultures, again, post agricultural movement and that change um, 10 to 12,000 years ago, where now we start to fear nature in a new way, in a qualitatively different way few examples of how you could do that. Basically, fear of nature. So ecophobia is a type of phobia, phobia a fear of nature itself. Eco representing, in a sense, nature. But eco, of course, is much bigger than nature, as far as I'm concerned. However, that ecophobia, when I started reading that literature, and many people are getting into it now, um, with his leadership and others, um, they're basically still constructing fear, constructing the definition, the meaning, the imaginary fear, still in very what I call traditional psychological terms, and as an emotion, as a factor. And so I wasn't seeing the big change. So I said, okay, now they're at least eco, the eco concern, eco criticism is bringing in phobia. So there's the ego component that I showed in the last slide. Aha, there it is. I'm starting to snoop. It's coming out. And then I asked myself, well, why don't we have something called ego criticism? Which would be 
you know, and you can think of it however you want, but it's the psychological aspect of how ego, and that's, I'm again, small ego, but there's a bigger ego, which I'll go into a little bit, but that's not the point of I don't actually go into it. I've already just sort of described it. It tends to be this path, this metaphysical path uh, of spirit, if you will, in Ken Wilber's view of the arising, uh, ascending current, um, kind of a solar complex within thought and uh, reality. And that I won't be able to go into here, as I say, so. And ego criticism would look at fear. And that's my whole point of eco and ego. Let's look at that ecology plus the fear. And so Desh Suba, coming out of Nepal, was a literary writer, poet, scholar. He now lives in Hong Kong. And I met him in 2014. And Desh Suba wrote a book called Philosophy of Fearism. And it was all about how fear conducts life, directs life. Life is controlled by fear. And he, in 1999, came up with this idea that um, Fearism is a concept that we might want to use in, in literary criticism. So that was very exciting. And, and I saw him on the internet. He, I think he contacted me and we said, wow, we have some very similar interests in making fear a foundational construct for actually understanding all human activity, nature, reality. So it's kind of an ecology of fear of entire human activity. And of course, you could even go beyond humans to bring fear in. So um, then he and I wrote a book um, where we did an East-West dialogue. So I said, well, you, you come from an Eastern perspective. Uh, I don't come from a literary perspective, but I come from a fearologist perspective. So I'm going to you know, write this book with you. I led the project, and he was happy to, to have me you know, write with him. Uh, English is not his first language, so his English translations of his work, and I recommend his book, Philosophy of Beerism, but it's, it's not a good translation. And, and he couldn't afford to get a really good one. So it's got problems. So I was trying to use this next book in 2016 um, to upgrade that. And I think if you look at the cover of that book, uh, the East West Dialogue book, you can see I designed the cover of my own artwork just to show a kind of perspective upon perspective um, that's required, even though I've got the word fear, if you look really closely, and it's, it's on each of those objects or spheres. Um, that are colored, and then the globe, right? The, the blue planet that we live on here on Earth is actually mounted so that it's not quite touching, it's on another sphere of itself. And then there's us as the viewer looking at the sphere and the sphere. And I actually call those bottom disks emotospheres, um, which is this complex of the emoto reality, the emotional reality, if you will, of the complex of ecology is going on. So you can see I'm really trying to create perspectives that are much larger than a quote of biological, psychological view of fear. So again, just some dates on uh, to give, give you a sense of how this fearism idea has been developing for a long time. And just to let you know, I use fearism also like terrorism. So I use it in two ways. Fearism is just a philosophy or a lens on how to look at reality, life, and eco-criticism, obviously. But then I also was using fearism back even earlier in 1990. I started using it a bit in my writing as I said, well, you know, terrorism is easy to understand as a concept. But what is underneath terrorism that is building up, building up, accumulating, right? Just like my diagrams, it's accumulating that causes terrorism as the big explosion of fearism. So I was using fearism as fearism in a toxic form that was building and building to where terrorism is. And I was basically saying, how come we have all this talk about terrorism? We don't have any talk about fearism. That was 1990, I was thinking about that. So just to end this slide before I go on the next, you can see once you bring in a philosophy of ego criticism here, philosophy of fearism is one approach. I'm not saying this is the only approach to ego criticism, but I think it would be very useful to recalibrate the balance there between fear and ecology. So that's why the title of my talk was Ecology and Fear, or Should We Be? And this is the ought to be, the should be, the philosophical question. Maybe we ought to be looking at fear a little bit more and putting ecology even secondary for a while.
because we've put ecology so much first, fear second, fear has not advanced conceptually, in my view, under the ecology banner. So that's a real claim I'm making right now, that we need a fearological perspective, a philosophy of fearism. Again, that's a long complex, whole other lecture on what is a philosophy of fearism. But you get the idea of what I'm trying to transition here. And so you can see, basically I'm saying an eco approach plus an ego approach in criticism would lead to me, in my view, they would lead to us understanding the fear matrix, what I call how human society since at least 12,000 years, but maybe before, there's been that rise. So on my last slide, and I invite lots of questions after for sure, um, the last slide is basically fearism, so using the philosophy of fearism, Desh Suba and myself. What's our challenge here to literary criticism and eco criticism? In general, fearism presents a case for a very epistemological reevaluation of the nature and role of fear and how do we know fear? How do we come to know? How good is our knowledge and knowing? about fear itself. So that's one of the things fearism brings. It brings a real critical perspective, a reflective perspective, a transdisciplinary perspective to analyzing those discourse. So fear is power, if you start there, and then go to this notion of fear evolving and morphing, as I've said earlier, into a you know, qualitatively different kind of fear with fear marks, as I put on scare marks on the word fear itself, and then adding the ism onto fear also is another way of signifying we're not just talking about ordinary fear here. And that makes methodological problems. It creates questioning of the very ways that we talk about, create discourses of imaginaries for um, in all domains, across all kinds of disciplines. Um, literary as well as all the other disciplines of knowing and knowledge and those are including even popular culture of course which is really important in constructing knowledge and so these are like educational spheres on the education of fear and what i'd call the education of fear management education and that is uh, myself as an educator professional educator um, i'm continually wanting us to begin to realize when we are investigating fear, talking, writing, performing about fear, that we always see ourselves as we're on a mission here, um, even unconsciously to better understand the nature of fear. I think that's why we perform, that's why we create these concepts around fear. Um, ultimately, I do think that you know no organism wants to live in the state of fear. Again, at the same time I say that, there's a, there's a whole now language of, well, what kind of fear am I talking about? What kind of fear are you talking about? And I'm not just talking about fears, uh, different fears. The qualitative difference in the very construction of fear knowledge has to be taken in as part of the fear problem. So again, I think that's the, the complexity I've added to um, Desh to some degree as well but my expertise and interest has really been on the epistemological problems. What I call discourse hegemonies that dominate the field of understanding and imagining what fear is. And uh, you know, just for one quick example, there's a, an interesting researcher in education that uh, is my field in critical education, uh, Peter McLaren, and he raised in 1995, this was you know before 9-11, he said, there is right now in my view, uh, an arising in American culture, he was specifically looking at in 1995, an arising of a hyper real new species of fear, I'm quoting him. Wow, that language is very interesting to me. A hyper real new species of fear arise. That's not just more, again, as I say, you know, concentration or quantity of fear. And certainly we've seen in the last few years in America sort of you know, 15 later, years later after Peter McLaren's declaration and really a theory um, of this hyper real fear species that he calls morphing about, and we don't even understand it all that well, is 
you know, one of the theories behind his work and mine too, as you'll see, I talk about that a bit in the video ahead. But it, the idea was that we ought to be very humble when we come to understanding and, and not just read the symptoms. So if you look at American society in the last year, particularly, um, not only the pandemic, but the, you know, the uprisings of, around racism and just the massive problems with, you know, the Trump era administration and what it's done in, within American governance and the absolute chaos to, you know, terrifying conditions um, are real, but it's not just an arising rate of heating up of more fear. That's not going to probably help us solve and think about and analyze the problem going on. And Peter McLaren was actually trying to indicate, well, it's not just quantitative. There's a hyper real morphic change in the very nature of fear. And that means in the very nature of our self, and our relationship to it. We cannot extract our self evolution from fears evolution and the morphing and changes going on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to say and conclude that uh, over 15 years of uh, little to no progress really I see in picking up on that. There's a bit um, the importance of the real qualitative changing of what fear might be. So that takes a lot of, a lot of study and fear studies itself is something that I've suggested that we need to bring into the academy and other places to, to actually give the specialization that's required. In North America, that, and I think, you know, that's spreading around the globe like a virus, to use the phrase. And uh, that, that starts to make me think, maybe we don't understand fear as well as we think we do. Is that one of the reasons Right? This is just a question, a hypothesis. Maybe if we, our epistemology, our ways of knowing about fear are actually quite inadequate to the actual increasing concentration of fear and the impact it's having on humanity and on the planet and its ecological systems. Okay? So that creates an ethical issue as well. When is fear actually an ethical concern? Not just a psychological problem, not just the even you know a biological problem that we can treat with pharmacological you know interventions or other kinds of interventions that are more materialistic. I get to the philosophical issue of perhaps fear. If I in this reconstruction, right, this fearism reconstruction, a fearological reconstruction, fear is actually a pivotal ethical issue. And until we bring that into actual social behavior to cultural behavior, to our world views that we operate in organizational development, governance, policy, without making fear and good fear education primary, I think it's an ethical issue. We could actually be undermining ourselves as a species and many species on this planet into an extinction, basically collapsing scenario. And I know this conference is about challenging some of that collapsing narrative, which I agree, we need to challenge it. So the other issues, I'll just go through them briefly. Collaboration, uh, fearism challenges us to be more collaborative in understanding fear. One of the things I try to have conversations with is people from all disciplines. I wanna be able to talk about fear with anybody from any discipline. Now, whether I can do that or not, or do it well, that's another question, but that's one of my challenges. That's a transdisciplinary perspective. I ought to be able to have those dialogues with all people from physiology, biophysiology, all the way up to theology. That should not be a problem. That should be a synthesis and an interway, a transdisciplinary way of gaining better knowledge about fear and its management and education. And legitimation issues, fearism challenges anybody who basically says, well, fearism hasn't established a track record, which it hasn't. It doesn't belong in a research university. It doesn't have degrees. It doesn't, it's all made up. We're, you know, we're basically artists. Desh Suba and I, and we're making up these terms because we think the language is even inadequate in the way we speak and think and imagine about fear. So we're just adding our own language, but I think all creative people throughout history have done this. And you know whether it's legitimate or not is of course a question, and I agree. I don't say that all, everything we know or the conjectures we make are even accurate. They may need to change. So the last one is existential issues in a collapsed psychology. I am very convinced that we have to change um, 
our you know views. So I talk about a couple of different things. And in this talk, because I, I don't think I have much time left, um, just to summarize, uh, a meta motivational theory I have, which starts on a basis of an ecology of fear. And that is that predator prey relationships. We have to understand that that is a major motivator of all living things, human beings included. We are still in many ways, basically animals, but we are very unique and amazing animals. And yes, we even have a spiritual nature as well. However, we're still on a primary foundational level motivated by an ecology of fear. And that's an ecology of defense intelligence is another way to speak about that. I say we're motivated by an ecology of love above that. And then we're motivated by an ecology of freedom. An uh, ecology of love could also be called an ecology of relationality, mutual relationality. And the ecology of freedom um, is could also be called an ecology of transcendence. That I arc out, that movement, those basic meta-motivational, you know, templates really for understanding human behavior. That's another lecture, of course. But I argue those are a fearlessness perspective. And now that I'm talking to people in the East, I'm so happy to talk to you because in the East, I have found more literature more writing and thought and about fearlessness than anywhere else in the world. So, um, in the in the when it comes to the West, um, they're just not interested in you know basically um, fearlessness. And in fact, the clinical psychologists uh, they label fearlessness as a disease. Uh, they make it a clinical psychological syndrome, and I say, well, okay, that's fine, but that's a very narrow definition of fearlessness. Fearlessness has a very long trajectory. And, you know, for, for any of you that know um, Abhaya Anadana in the Sanskrit tradition, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Abhaya Dana, it's the gift tradition, the gift of fearlessness tradition. So there's quite a fascinating literature um, on looking at Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism that I had found back in the late 90s on the gift of fearlessness culture and philosophy. And that doesn't surprise me. The Bhagavad Gita, one of the things it says is the virtue of all virtues. There's a section in the Bhagavad Gita. Again, I'm not an expert in these. You can see I just pick out certain things that I find interesting in discourses. Fearlessness in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, is virtue of all virtues it does not say love is the virtue of all virtues it's not discarding love and it's important but it doesn't put it as a virtue love is more an ontological reality and the practice of coming to love to live love is the practice of fearlessness and it's a practice of a gift of fearlessness which is basically not letting fear control my life as best i can and then not dumping that fear and trying to control others by the use of fear, misuse of fear. Okay, so I think that's lots. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to entertain those as best I can. So I'll stop the share there. And uh, I, the second video, as I say, we'll have the Q&A, um, really an interesting conversation we got into, and I'll be glad to comment again on that as a meta conversation. Um, just to say that um, it's really li interesting listening to to me having to give a lecture on fear <laughs> to anybody. Um, it's, it's one thing I, I couldn't say and I didn't say, but I, I want to make it very clear that you have to listen to the way I give a talk on fear. You have to almost listen to, okay, well, is he talking about the, the way we understand fear now? you know, based on dictionaries, encyclopedias, traditional discourses, and or is he talking about this new qualitative shift, this morphing new fear um, of a different qualitative nature that he's talking about, more constructed, right? Less, more natural, perhaps more cultural, we could argue. And that cultural has, you know, political implications as well, very powerfully. And so I just want to share with you, friends, that this is a, a very difficult, to talk about both at the same time. And I even myself 
can get confused and not knowing, you know, what I'm actually communicating across to you and what lens you are receiving from me. So how do we get around that problem of knowing which lens? Is it the ordinary lens of understanding fear or is it this new fearist construction lens that Dash Duba talks about a fearist lens that we require? I talk about a fearlessness lens as well uh, required. So we're actually having to learn to change lens, which is part of a perspectival philosophy and processing and perception. It's really a new perception required for our time. Very exciting is an exploration of these, this change in our perceptions to be able to handle and un analyze a fear problem, the fear problem, you know, if you will. So um, just wanted to sort of point that out. It's a kind of apologizing for what's he really talking about. But if you're getting things, if you're picking up things in the way I'm teaching, the pedagogy of how I teach about fear, which is really important and it's also evolving. I'm in process, I'm in progress. So is Desh and others who deal with fearism. We're, we're still trying to figure out how to actually teach it. And um, you, in some sense, so we appreciate that, you know, you're, you're with us trying to, to help us with that. Um, because your feedback is so important. Um, so anything you can share on the video below um, when I post this um, will most be appreciated in that exploration of inquiring, right? We're, we're not so much trying to get the truth about everything, um, but we're really trying to improve the, the quality of the communication through pedagogy, good pedagogy based on fearism, fearlessness, and perhaps there's other angles that we haven't even looked at. Okay. so. Glad to share this with you. Um, look forward to your comments. Tune in. Next video coming soon. Bye-bye.